Okay, so sex is a big general topic. Is there anything outside, off limits? Yes. Uh, any sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman, the Bible defines as sexual immorality. Greek word is porneo. It's where you get the word pornography. Porneo means, or it's translated oftentimes as fornication, uh, but it means sex outside of the covenant of marriage. So marriage outside of sex is off limits for a Christian. And it's not because God's approved, it's because God understands the nature of sex and what it's meant to do. Sex is a bonding agent, body, soul, and spirit between two people. And it takes place within the confines of the covenant of marriage because the covenant of marriage is a forever covenant relationship of commitment and safety and security. It's where families are born out of. It's in the good times and the bad times. And two people become one flesh in that relationship. A lot of people are like, well, how can I know if I'm compatible with the person that I'm marrying unless I, you know, I, we got to try it out a little bit. That is the way of the world. It's like you're, you're not buying a car. You don't need to test drive a person. You make a commitment to a person. And the longer you're married, the more sexually compatible you become because you learn, you become an expert in that person. It's not about that person meeting your needs. It's about you growing and learning how to meet their needs. Okay, so number one is sex outside of marriage. In the confines of marriage, Hebrews chapter 13 says that the marriage bed, or that marriage should be held in honor by all and that the marriage bed is undefiled. So that's both descriptive and prescriptive. Number one, we need to hold marriage in honor. Okay, we need to hold that. It's, it's the first institution that God established. When he brought Eve to Adam because he looked at Adam and said, it's not good that he's alone. He brought him a dog, not good enough. Brought him a cat and he said, heaven's no. <clears throat> and he's like, he needs, he needs a partner. So he created woman out of man, not to look like man, but to compliment man. And he brought woman to the man. God performed the first wedding. He walked Eve down the aisle, and the reason why she got the name woman is when Adam saw her, he went, whoa, man, and the name stuck. <clears throat> Get that? Okay. Um, is that in Genesis no, 2? It's, or is, oh, okay, yeah. Okay. It's in the coming trans translation. So <clears throat> when it says that the marriage bed is undefiled, it's both descriptive and prescriptive. It's, it's, pre it's descriptive because what God is saying is that within the confines of marriage, Anything that is consensual between both partners, anything that is pleasurable and is agreed upon, and anything that is not damaging and not injurious, and anything that is not rooted in, uh, in what the Bible calls uncleanness or impurity, it's, it's things, if we've been raised up in a porn culture, which a lot of people have, you know, the average 10-year-old boy sees his first expression, what did you say, uh, 10? Was it 10? No, what, so the, the quote was actually that children nowadays are seeing how to perform anal sex before they've even had their first kiss. I mean, it's like very, yeah. very young. So I think, I think the, the like statistic I old, saw yeah. is that uh, a 10-year-old boy will have seen over 200 sexual visual examples of pornography before he, before he hits 10 years old in our culture. So we have a porn culture, we have a porn problem. And we import all of our baggage into our marriage relationship. So, and what I'm talking about is this. I'm talking about, um, when I mean coercive or damaging, I'm talking about like bondage and you know things that are injurious to the physical body. Ephesians 5 says, a husband should love his wife as his own body. Nobody has ever damaged his own body, but he loves it and cherishes it. Husbands, love and cherish your wife's body. You're allowed to. In fact, you're commanded to. Wife, love and cherish and honor your husband's body. It's okay to love each other's body and to explore sexually. There's, you know, there's a lot of parameters there. It's like, is oral sex permitted? Yes, if it's consensual. Is anal sex, is, uh, you know, different positions? Is the only position you're allowed to have missionary because it's a Christian position? No, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to move about the cabin, okay? <laughs> but it has to be, it has to be mutual. <laughs> it has to be mutual, not coercive. 
and it has to be within the bonds of marriage. How's that? I'm, uh, I'm going to use that one tonight. Uh, and let me, let me throw one more thing in there. It needs to be limited to you yep. in your marriage. You don't bring other people into the marriage. I would say don't bring pornography because it's a fantasy of other people into the marriage. It's like, well, we're getting excited. No, you're getting excited because you're fantasizing about somebody outside of your marriage. And you can have impurity. This is why the writer of Hebrews says it's both prescriptive and descriptive. God describes the marriage bed as undefiled. You can, you can, you can have fun with each other. But also prescriptive. In other words, keep it clean. Keep it pure. Don't bring... Don't bring uh, weirdness in, into it or damage into it. And, you know, I think sometimes we're just like, oh, am I, am I, allowed, to, am I allowed to have fun? Yeah, that's why God says get married and, and have fun. Enjoy one another. The book Song of Solomon in your Bible is an allegory and metaphorical book about a, a man and his wife and their love affair, their engagement, and then their, their sexual life. In fact, rabbis wouldn't even allow Jewish boys to read the book of Song of Solomon until they hit a certain age because they all understood the metaphors. There is, I, I'm gonna rock your boat. Next time you're reading through the Bible, you're gonna get the Song of Solomon. And it's gonna like, whoa, I didn't know that. One of my opening questions was actually about a verse from Song of Solomon. But well, I, I mean, sworn. it's talking about... Uh, it's about the woman describing the man's ha ha, yeah. and <laughs> and it's talking about oral sex, and it's talking about exploring one another, and what I want to do to you, and it's it's all this intimate marriage love that's taking place in allegorical language, and so God's the one who wrote it. I mean, I think sometimes we think God's in heaven, going well, they can have missionary sex once in a while just to have babies, and then all of a sudden He looks down and goes, "What are they doing?" <laughs> I had no idea they'd try that. Wow, did you know this, Gabriel? What's going on? It was God's idea, but he wants us to do it in the right framework, okay, and have a healthy sexual relationship in our marriage. Yeah, I agree fully with that. So what my follow-up, before we hit our last question, I mean, just real quickly, you had said the phrase, you know, like the average eight to 10-year-old has seen this much now, and there's an increased intensity of sexualization just with our children, like in our yeah. culture. So what age do you feel like is now appropriate to have to have these hard conversations, not hard, but these real conversations with our kids about sex and sexuality? I, I think, unfortunately, far younger than we want to yeah. because it's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the conversation both about sex itself and the broader spectrum of sexual parameters and, and gender issues and identity issues is everywhere. It's on Nickelodeon, it's on apps, it's on YouTube, it's in your public school curriculums, it's everywhere, and it's, it's pervasive. And so it has driven parents to the point where you can't shelter your kids from it. Uh, I don't think you need to like sit them down at five years old and like break it all down for them, but I think you have to begin that conversation pretty early and prayerfully and with wisdom begin to introduce. Uh, and, and here's what I would do is I would introduce it from the vantage point of God's beautiful creation instead of the world's broken sinful inventions. Start from that standpoint. That way when they see other things that compare it to what, what God did create instead of starting out that this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. That's not what we need to do. We're, we don't want to create shame and and distrust or leeriness about sex. We want to paint a picture of this is how God has made you. And this is why your body is the way that it is. And here's what happens as you get older. And here's the gift that happens within marriage. And here's, here's where babies come from and that kind of thing. It just, I think I was 12 years old when I was in school and went through sex ed. And it was about that time my, uh, my stepdad had a sex talk with me and it wasn't very good. It was, it was like, well, if you just, if you just keep it in your pants, you're going to be all right. And I'm like, well, that helps. Thanks. <clears throat> um, but now we have to do that much earlier. 